Well, I'll say good morning to everyone. I'll start out with the, uh, the bad news that there's no class next Tuesday. And I'm sure that's upsetting everyone enormously. And then what next Thursday is Thanksgiving, so there's no class then. So there's no class next week, so I'm very sorry. But, uh, anyway, I think looking over the schedule, um, I don't think I'm going to have to do a makeup class. Uh, I think I will be able to cover all the material by the end of the semester. However, if it comes right down to the end of the semester and I haven't covered everything, I will remember that we didn't have this class, and so we'll, at that point, we'll have a makeup class if we have to. Homework due today, and a lot of old homework here that uh, I get tired of carrying back and forth between here and my office. So don't forget to pick it up today after class. So we're talking about testing of aspheric surfaces. And we broke the, the tests into two different sections. We had the null tests and the non-null tests. And so in the null test, some way we're adding some additional optical components to um, compensate for the acericity in the optics that we're testing, such that we're going to end up uh, interfering two plane waves, and we will get straight equally spaced fringes if, uh, if the aspheric optics we're testing are perfect. And so we're first talking here about some what I'll call conventional null optics. And um, probably the, the, the person who really got this going back in the, oh, I think it was probably in the 60s, was a man by the name of Abe Offner, who uh, worked at Perkin Elmer. And uh, uh, one of his first null compensators, which turns out to be uh, actually pretty useful, is just using a, say this is an aspheric mirror we want to test here. Uh, he was able to, to match the acericity of some of these mirrors by simply using a, a singlet here. Um, with the, the proper bending to get the acericity he wanted. And then he would use a field lens here to image this uh, singlet onto the, the mirror under test. And so that is what's often called the Offner null compensator. He had a, a very similar way using a lens down, uh, excuse me, using a mirror where he would have a spherical mirror and uh, he would use it at the appropriate conjugates such that it produced the right amount of acericity to match the mirror under test. And again, he almost always put in a field lens here that would image this pupil onto the, the uh, mirror under test. Um, these components, both the lens and the mirror here, were, had only spherical surfaces, so he could test these, each surface by itself, and uh, uh, determine that they had the, the proper shape. So that, that is one type of null corrector. Another type, which maybe you've seen before, this is something that's uh, quite well known, um, that if I have a hyperbolite, so I have a convex hyperbolite here of, um, uh, well, just a convex hyperbolite. And this, <coughs> the substrate here has some, well, this, con this hyperbolite has a, a conic constant k. And if it turns out, I mean, this just happens to turn out that if this material has a refractive index that goes as a square root of minus the conic constant of this hyperboloid, that you can put a point source here. And uh, this will actually collimate that source. And then this could be a flat surface. And the light would go back on itself. So this would be a nice null test of this hyperboloid. Now you might question how useful this is, because you do have to have a refractive index here that's the square root of minus the conic constant of this hyperboloid. So needless to say, it's somewhat limited 
in its use. But I always thought this was, it's kind of interesting that it, that it works out this way. Aidan Meinel, who started Optical Sciences and who our building is named after, was involved in a, in a, a lot of, of uh, telescope projects throughout his career. And uh, he has a, a test of hyperboloids that is, uh, is named after him. And it's, it's a little bit like this test here, except it's going to have a, a little more flexibility. And um, in this case, a hyperboloid is on uh, the second surface here. And um, he would make this so it had a certain um, slightly curved, slightly convex, and you could find conjugates here um, such that uh, the light after going through here, being refracted by this, would exactly match this surface, and this would be a nice null test. So, oops, so we have a spherical wave going in, and we have a spherical wave coming back. And um, he, uh, for different hyperboloids, he could uh, uh, just vary the, the uh, curvature of the surface a little bit. And then a, a similar approach he had here, again for, I mean in telescopes there's a lot of convex hyperboloids in the secondary. Um, so that's testing of convex hyperboloids is of a lot of interest. And in this particular case here, um, this would be a flat surface. Here's his hyperboloid and he would find the appropriate conjugates here, such that, let's say, he puts a point source here, light goes out here, refracted by this flat surface now, reflects off of this hyperboloid, and refracted again by the flat surface, and you, with the right conjugates here, um, you could get a nice uh, spherical wave, and so you'd have a spherical wave coming down here, and then if you're doing an interferometer test, I mean, but a lot of ways of doing it, but one might be to, to put either a convex surface here or a concave surface here, send the light back on itself and back here, and your interferometer would be back in, in this region over here. So that would be another, um, another uh, null test of hyperboloids. Now, a, a, Maybe a problem here is that for these tests, the, the material, the substrate material, has to be high quality. Now typically, I mean, what we're making here are mirrors, and typically you, the substrate that you put the mirror on would not have especially good uh, uniformity in its refractive index. But for these tests, for the Meinel hyperboloid test to work, the substrate here does have to have um, good uniformity. So that's a little limitation to this uh, effect, or uh, this uh, test. I don't think this has become a very common test. In a little bit, we'll see a much more common test for the, uh, for the hyperboloid. But let's just think here for a second about conics in general. Um, I mean, for the parabola, um, it has a very nice feature that if we put a point source at the right distance away, which turns out to be the vertex radius of curvature over two, or we often say the, the focal length away, uh, the light will reflect off of here and become a perfect collimated beam. And so one way we could set up an interferometer, we'll see more drawings of this coming up, but one way would be to put a flat here and put our, our interferometer here. Maybe you want to use some, a beam splitter and some fold optics so you don't have such a large obscuration in the test, although often these mirrors have a hole in the center anyway. Um, so we could have a nice null test simply by putting an interferometer, focusing the beam here, out here, reflects off here, a flat here. Oh, we have to have a good quality flat, at least as large as the parabola. 
and the light will come back here and to focus again. So that's a very common test for a parabola. For an ellipse, um, there are two well, foci positions that are calculated here from the vertex radius of curvature and the conic constant that if we put a point source, say here, distance d4 away, the light will go to the mirror. If this is a perfect ellipsoid, after reflection off the mirror, it will come to focus here. We could put either a convex mirror or a concave mirror here, send the light back on itself, come back here as a nice <coughs> perfect spherical wave. And if we had an interferometer out here, we could then interfere with this spherical wave or collimate it probably first and interfere it with a plane wave. And we would have a nice null test. For the hyperboloid, I, I draw it as a, as a concave one, but this also works for a convex one. That um, for the hyperboloid, it turns out you have um, two foci as well. And again, they're calculated from the vertex radius of curvature and from the conic constant. And uh, so we could put a point source here, reflect off of our hyperboloid, and we get a spherical wave coming out that appears to be coming from a point a distance d2 back here. And so we could, well, one way of doing this test would be to have a, a spherical mirror here. And we set up our interferometer in here, point source going out, spherical mirror, light coming back on itself, back here, nice spherical wave to our interferometer. And so we could have a null test. Now this requires a good quality um, spherical mirror for the test. But that's a, a common way of testing hyperboloids. In fact, there's a, a name of this test, which is called a Hindle test. And uh, I mean, often these hyperboloids are convex instead of concave. And so this is showing a, a test of, a, of this uh, convex hyperboloid. So one foci is here, and one foci is there. So we would set up our interferometer back here, reflect off of here. What the beam coming off here looks just like a nice spherical wave from, from here, as long as that's the right hyperboloid. Spherical wave. We go to a sphere here. Whoops. A sphere there. And guess what they call the, that sphere? They call it a Hindle sphere. And um, the light will come back here on itself uh, and come back here to our interferometer. So this Hindle test is a very common test for uh, hyperboloids. And if we come down here, this is, is not so common, but I uh, sketched it out anyway. Or I, I think I actually took this figure out of Malakira's book. If we have a parabola, we can have a collimated beam coming in. And this is a convex parabola. So after reflection off there, it appears to be a spherical wave coming from here. And we put our spherical mirror here, send the light back, back on itself, and back here again uh, to our collimator. And here we could have put our interferometer. So it's just like, as far as the interferometer is concerned, it's just like testing a spherical mirror. Well, this is probably not so widely used, but the Hindle test is widely used. If I look at that drawing, what do you think the problem is with a Hindle test? Especially if we're testing convex hyperboloids. Well, let's see. We have a little hyperboloid here, and we have a big mirror out here, big sphere. So that's our problem. So the problem is, I mean, most of these hyperboloids are convex. So the light reflected off of it diverges pretty fast. And we don't want to, we want to test most of the mirror. You know, maybe the center 
right at the center maybe we don't have to test it but we don't want to have a large region in the center we don't test and so typically you have to come this mirror at least for the Hindle test as we described it is generally quite a distance away and you have a little central obscuration so you can get the uh, circle beam in but it's not very large and so the problem is that you get for testing a very small convex hyperboloid, you end up with a large Hindle sphere. And often if you visit an optic shop, if it's an optic shop that's making hyperboloids anyway, you'll, you'll see you know, a very large circle mirror. And uh, you'll know right away that that's, what they, that's their Hindle sphere. So you'd like to get around this problem of having a large, requiring a large Hindle sphere for testing a small convex hyperboloid. And so there are a couple ways of, of getting around this. And the first one is what's called the silver tooth test. Now I have to admit, I, I'm not a great lover of the silver tooth test, but um, it's fairly well known, so I feel I need to talk about it. So, as I said, you normally have you normally want to test convex hyperboloids. If I had a concave hyperboloid, it wouldn't diverge so fast, and I wouldn't need such a large mirror. So, what Silvertooth, Bud Silvertooth said is, okay, I want to make a convex hyperboloid. But what I'm going to do first is I'm going to make a concave hyperboloid. And then I'm going to use it as a test plate to test, you know, a little physotype test plate to test my convex hyperboloid. And he said, well, you know, if I have a concave hyperboloid, the beam is not going to diverge so fast. And so for a given diameter here, I don't need such a large sphere. Of course, you have to make two hyperboloids now. You have to make the convex hyperboloid, which is what you want, but you also have to make this concave hyperboloid um, as a so you can use that as a test plate. So maybe you get around the requirement for a large sphere, but you end up having to make two hyperboloids instead of one. So I never, I never. Um, Never was very crazy about the silver tooth test. So I'll, I'll just I have to tell a little story about Bud Silvertooth. I, I, uh, he's no longer alive, but um, he, was, he was a very smart guy. He, he graduated from Caltech when he was 17 or 18 years old. And he spent most of his career uh, working for the government on classified programs. And he, he was a very a very clever guy, sort of late in his, and he was very much involved in the founding of optical sciences and the, uh, the money that started the, the place here and built the center building. He was very much involved with that. And he was a very powerful guy. And so when Bud Silvertooth said something, you had to listen to him. Well, kind of late in his career, he decided that Einstein was wrong. And the theory of relativity was wrong. And so he began putting together um, papers on relativity. And he even funded a big project here at, at Optical Sciences to try to show that uh, uh, Einstein was wrong, which I know it's kind of hard to do, actually, show that Einstein's wrong. So anyway, he, he, he would put together these papers on relativity. and I. I mean, I certainly am no expert on relativity, but at that time I was the young, uh, the young professor here, young assistant professor here, and so he would send these papers over here for us to look at, and I was always given the job to find out what's wrong with him because we always knew something was wrong with him, and it was the same thing every time. He would keep switching reference f frames as he went through the paper. So anyway, I don't know. He was uh, he was an interesting guy, but he uh, he was certainly a very powerful guy. And, but he never did prove that Einstein was wrong. So 
Anyway, so that's the silver tooth test. The Simpson Olin Meckel test is something that I think is a lot, a lot better than the um, uh, silver tooth test. And um, so the idea here is that we can see here. That's that's my hindle. I mean, excuse me. That's my hyperboloid right there. And all they what they said was the following. They said, well. Let's make a little shell here. So this is a spherical surface. And this is going to be a spherical surface here. And if we put a point source back here, the light will go through here and uh, st strike this hyperbolite, come back here, and this is now our reflecting mirror. And since we can put it real close, because we're transmitting through the mirror, we we'll put it real close, it doesn't need to be much larger than the hyperbolite. And so the light will go out here, come back here, back here off the hyperbolite again, and come back here. And our interferometer could be put back here. And this is our null test. Now I also show another mirror here, which I call a calib calibration sphere. So what that's for is that you know, the light goes through this shell here. And this shell introduces a little bit of aberration into the beam. So what comes through the shell is no longer a perfect spherical wave. So what we're going to do first is we're going to take this, hind uh, this hyperbolite out of here. And so we just have this shell and this mirror. And we will test that combination. And so that will tell us what little aberration comes from this, well, what he called a half silvered spherical Hindle surface, but from this shell here. We'll measure that separately. Then we'll put in our hyperboloid. Now we don't use this anymore. We'll put in our hyperboloid. Do this test here, hyperboloid, reflect off here, back to the hyperboloid, and back out here. And from that test result, we will subtract out whatever aberration we measured in the first measurement, where we just went through this shell to our uh, sphere and back again. Okay. So this requires a mirror that's not much larger than our hyperboloid. It has to be made out of good material, because we're going through it twice. And both sides here have to have nice, smooth spherical surfaces. And, uh, and it result, uh, involves this calibration process. Okay. So I want you to, I don't care too much whether you, how much you remember the silver tooth test, but I really do want you to remember the Hindle test, and I want you to remember this simpson olin Meckel test. I don't know, it's a long name. You don't have, after the three people who wrote the paper on it. But uh, I don't care if you remember the names or not, but remember how this test works. So any questions on how that, how that works? Okay. Well, I'm going to go back to the parabola again for a short period of time here. And uh, I mean, a couple ways, say this is a parabola. I mean, you could do a, a point source here. So this is at you know, the focal point, vertex radius of curvature over two away, collimate the light, flat hole in it, or a beam splitter to bring the light in, but typically a hole in it back here and back here. And our interferometer could be set up here. So that, you know, we, we mentioned that before. We could also do the following. We could put a source here, reflect off the flat to the parabola. And so now it looks like the source is way off here to the, to the left. Off the parabola, collimated, back to the, oops, back to the flat, 
back to the parabola, back to the flat to focus, and here our interferometer could be again. So we have the choice of what we have on the right and what we have on the left. Can, can you give me some advantages and disadvantages of one over the other one? Well, this one? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this, this requires a hole in the center of the parabola. This one involved, involved a hole in the center of the flat. And you're right that often you're going to have this hole here anyway. So that's one good thing. Two more. I, two more things. At least two more things. Maybe you can think of more than two. Well, flats once, twice, three times. Three times, yeah. So does that make any difference? Yeah, that's uh, the flat. You're really taxing the flat. It has to be a better flat, or you have to some way calibrate that out. But you, here you're reflecting off of the flat just once, and here you're reflecting off of it three times. And so you're, you know, any errors in the flat, you're going to see three times as much here as here. So that's gives you an advantage over here as opposed to there. And the third, what, what else might we see? This is just looking at it. The left one is compact. Yeah, that's right. That's what I was looking for. Right. This is uh, more compact. This is, uh, well, so this is, you know, you dividing this up into two where you have the whole distance here. So this is more compact than, than here. So depending on how large your room is, that could be a pretty important item. Or if you're putting this on a vibration isolation table, this might be a lot easier than this. So anyway, both these techniques are, are, um, are used. And uh, I don't know that I would say that one is more common than the other one. The... Uh, well, I'll just show an ellipse here, elliptical mirror, uh, point source. We, we showed this before, but light coming down here, and either convex or concave mirror here, sending light back here again. Oblate uh, spheroid, uh, they're terrible to test. You don't want to test them. You, you have these conjugates, and it's a nice null in the plane of the screen, but it's not a null out of the plane of the screen, and so put in some cylindrical optics here to try to take care of that problem. These are terrible to test, though. I mean, this looks, you know, you, any ellipse you can do. The problem is sometimes these distances are just completely unreasonable and um, not, not practical. Anyway, so we, we've seen a few what I call conventional null tests. And what I want to do now is to go on to what I'll call a, a holographic null test. And we're going to first talk about one that maybe is not so useful, and then we're going to go to one that is used all the time nowadays. So this one, you know, if, how many of you have made a hologram? Did I make? No one. One, anyone, two, three, four, okay. Yeah, everyone, everyone. You shouldn't get a degree in optics without making a hologram, I think. Um, it's wonderful, so much fun. But um, anyway, a holographic test like the following would work if Let's say someplace I got a master A sphere. I mean, that's the, that's the whole problem with this test. I have to have a master A sphere. And, um, uh, you know, I don't have to use this particular test setup, but I, it's convenient, so I will. 
So the light goes out here, strikes my master ace here, and I have some terrible aceric wavefront coming back here through this lens and, and down here. And then I, I bring in a reference beam. And so when I interfere these two beams, I get what I normally think of as an interferogram, but I could call that a hologram just as well. And uh, I record that on some recording material. And uh, now, after I process the material and put it back in place, if I were to block this beam here, but just illuminate it with a reference, well, I'm going to get several beams leaving my hologram. But one of these beams will be a replica of the wavefront that came from this A-sphere that I'm testing. Okay, <clears throat> and I could, so I get several orders from the hologram, and if I put enough tilt between the two interfering beams, these orders will separate, and uh, I can pick out the beam that matches, or that the beam that replicates the beam that came from this aspheric element. So that's down here. Now I could take, you know, I can put in another aspheric element that's not perfect. And I set that up, <coughs> and I get that beam coming out here, and I interfere that beam with the beam that was stored in the hologram, the beam that originally came from my perfect A-sphere. And if this A-sphere, the second one I'm testing, is perfect, you know, it's the same as the first one, then I can get my straight equally spaced fringes down here. Okay. So any questions on that? There's a couple other ways of thinking about this. <clears throat> I said that you know, I stored in this hologram the aspheric wavefront coming from this perfect asphere. And then later, I interfered the wavefront coming from the mirror under test with the wavefront that was stored in here. So that's one way of thinking about it. A second way of thinking is that when I interfered well, that if I were to illuminate this hologram with this perfect aspheric wavefront and blocked off, blocked off the reference beam here, you know, a, one of the beams produced by this hologram would be a replica of that reference beam. So if I were to put my spatial filter in the right location here, I could select out the replication of that reference beam, which, you know, after going through the lens, is going to be a spherical wave. Boy, I keep hitting that wrong. Okay. And so I can pick either, you know, if I, if I, I can think I can pick out either an aspheric wavefront here, or I can pick out a, a plane wave. So I can think of when I put in my second asphere here, this illuminates it, and if it's perfect, it's going to produce a plane wave out here. If it's not perfect, it's going to be, produce an aberrated plane wave. And now I interfere that with this plane wave. And I see the difference. So it's equivalent whether I, out here, if I pick this to pick out the plane wave, you know, the, the plane wave from here and the plane wave produced by this beam illuminating the hologram, or if I pick it to produce the aspheric wavefront and the aspheric wavefront produced by illuminating the hologram with the reference mirror. Like either they're both equivalent. Or the third way of thinking about this is when I interfered these two, I got you know, some complicated fringe pattern here. I put in a different asphere, I interfere the two, I get another complicated fringe pattern, and now I'm seeing the moray between these two fringe patterns. So I can think of it as a holographic process or as a moray process. Okay. Well, I mean, this is a, a great idea, except for it to work, I have to have, oops, excuse me, uh, I already jumped ahead. This is a great idea, except to make this work, I have to 
have a perfect A-sphere to start with. Okay, so let's say, well, I don't have a perfect A-sphere to start with. So that take me to the slide ahead up here that I can calculate on the computer what this hologram would look like if I did have a perfect A-sphere. And so instead of recording an A-sphere in the lab, I will calculate on a computer what the A-sphere is, or what the hologram is, and I will draw that out and put that in place. And I'll call that a computer-generated hologram. And the, the A-sphere might look like, or well, the hologram might look like this. And you don't see, yeah, you see a little bit there. I mean, this is a kind of simple hologram because if I put the more complex one up there, uh, you wouldn't even see the, see the lines. So this is just saying, well, I'm pretending as though I have a perfect A-sphere here. I go through here and I calculate what the hologram would look like if I interfere with these two, and that gives me my, my hologram. Okay. Now, we've used holo computer-generated holograms here quite a lot at Optical Sciences. Have any of you worked with a computer-generated hologram? Yeah, okay. Well, when I, when I first got out of college, the very first thing I worked on was computer-generated holograms. And the problem back in those days was um, really drawing this hologram. We didn't have good ways of drawing holograms. But fortunately, nowadays, we do have good ways. And we'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. But so this is, has now become a very practical way of testing um, aceric optics. Now, it's kind of interesting that we have all these different orders coming out of this hologram. Um, and if we look in this plane here, we'll see the different orders. And uh, I have a picture I'm going to show you in a second then of just looking in this plane, taking a photograph of what's in that plane, all the different orders. And so that would be our zero order. That would be our plus one order. A minus one, plus two, minus two, and so on. Okay. And so the plus one order, if I, if I took this hologram and I interfered it with a plane wave, the plus one order would have the acericity in it that you would have in the, in the perfect... Uh, element that you're testing here. And a minus one order will turn out to have minus that acericity. And the plus two order will have two times that acericity. And the minus two order will have minus two times as much. So if we look at these blur circles, you can see that the second order blur is twice the size of the first order. And the third order here is three times the size of the first order. Okay. Now I kind of like this configuration for doing the hologram for, for a couple of reasons. One is the way that we have set this up here. Uh, well, first off, this lens is going to image this element we're testing here. So it's fairly, it's easier than to calculate what the acericity is because of that. But the real reason I like it is because both the test, the test beam and the reference beam go, are going through the hologram. And so the hologram is on some substrate, probably a glass substrate, and it may not be a flat substrate, but both reference and test beams are going through it. And so any thickness variations in this substrate will cancel out. Yes? So the alignment of this will require you to uh, have the plus one order of the light that's coming from the aspheric element go through the pin one and the zero order from the reference mirror pass through. Is that what you're interfering with? Well, we can, <clears throat> it, uh, it, there's several different ways of, of doing that. One way is to have the zero order from the aspheric element and the plus one order 
from the mirror, in which case we would be interfering two aspheric wave fronts down here, but they should match, so we should get straight fringes. So it'd be, it would be zero order from here, ah, boy, uh, plus one order from here. Okay. The other way of doing it is to have the zero order from here. So that's going to be a plane wave, circle wave down here. And the minus one order from here. So in that case, what we're doing, this hologram is subtracting acericity from this order. So it could be zero order minus one. Maybe it's easiest to see this right here. Um, you know, you, you can either interfere plane waves or you can interfere identical aspheric wave fronts. Now you want to make sure that, you know, if you want to interfere the, the plus one order, make sure you're not by mistake interfering the minus one order because that has minus acericity in it. So this is really identical to what we have here, except here we have recorded the hologram, and here we have computed, computed on a, well, computer has computed what the hologram should look like, and in some way, we're going to worry about in a minute, but some way we're going to plot the hologram and put it in place. And the hologram is basically just the interference fringes that you would get um, if you um, were to interfere these two beams. Okay. Uh, so, are you called a tilt carrier, which you, mm -hmm. the way that's shaped kind of like a grating to separate them. Yeah. And if you were trying to do that with uh, the original technique where you generate the hologram in the interferometer, you purposely put in tilt and then record hologram with tilt, does that make that same? That's effect? right. If you want to really separate these orders, like here, I'm separating the, well, the, the first and the second. I don't worry about the third and the second because I'm not going to use that. But here I've separated the, the first and the second order. So I had to put in enough tilt. So that's why we have a lot of fringes going across here. And physically, what you would do here is you would just tilt the reference beam to separate the orders. And you can do the same thing with power by defocusing the A-sphere from the diverger, make a power carrier. Yeah, if you wanted to do a, a power carrier, you could, you could change the separation between the diverger and the mirror you're testing. If I were to change the separation here, and change the power, then I would change the size of the spot here, and I might have to introduce more tilt in order to separate the orders. So you, you, you try to put in the right amount of, t of power to make this spot size as small as possible. In other words, I'll make the maximum slope of the wavefront as small as possible. So I said I'd like, you know, I like this setup here, mostly because both beams are going through the, the hologram. And so I don't have to worry about substrate variations. But this is not the most common way of doing the holographic test. This right here is probably the most common way of doing the holographic test. And so what we're doing here, so it's our laser-based fuzzo. We're putting our hologram here, mirror with testing here, and so, and our reference is still there. So now the light is diffracted by the hologram to produce an aceric wavefront that will match this surface here. And then this beam comes back here, and it's going to be diffracted a second time in order to produce a spherical wave that will interfere with our, our, uh, spherical wave coming from the reference. So the nice thing here, 
Well, first off, it's nice in that it's just, this is just a regular commercial interferometer that we put a little mount on the output here to hold the hologram. Otherwise, it's completely commercial interferometer. So that's nice. Negative things, well, we're going through the hologram twice. It's being diffracted by the hologram twice. And so we have to have higher diffraction efficiency. So generally, this is a phase-type hologram, and often it's, it's etched into a, piece of, into a piece of glass. So it's a phase-type hologram to get higher efficiency. And the third thing is that only the test beam is going through here. And so any thickness variations in that substrate will bother us. And so this requires that we have a a good quality substrate, or we calibrate out the substrate, but I always think you should have a, 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 good, a good quality substrate here. Oops. Okay. I mean, other ways of doing this, so, um, there's a so-called zone plate interferometer here, which is kind of interesting. It reminds me a little bit of the scatter plate uh, in the sense that, so this is what we're testing. We set this up so the beam is focused onto this mirror, comes back. So this is going to be our reference right here. And then this produces a wavefront that matches this surface here. Light will retroreflect right back on itself and be diffracted here a second time um, to produce another spherical wave, which will interfere with our reference. So this is a, another common path type interferometer, less sensitive to vibration. Um, I don't think this is too widely used, but it's kind of it's kind of interesting. And then. Um, what Jim Burge has, has done a lot with over the years is to um, have a, a fazo type interferometer here where he puts uh, a hologram on one of the surfaces here. I'll show some better pictures of that in just a second. But anyway, so this would be our reference surface, but the light be diffracted by the hologram, match our surface we're testing here and back on itself. And um, this is just, I think I have a couple more slides of this, of, of um, Jim Burge's technique here. So it can be either, in this case, we the test plate is first, and the hologram is on the test plate, and then this is what we're testing. Or it could be the acer could be first, and the test plate with a hologram on it could be could be second here. And really, what's happening here is that we have, um, you know, say here's our test plate, we put our hologram on that, and so the light is refracted and diffracted both here, such that it, the the beams leaving here will be normal. Um, to the a sphere that we're testing. In this case, we're going to have to make a hologram as large as the optic that we're testing. And so Jim Burge, back when he did his PhD dissertation, he built a, uh, a large plotter for making large holograms on, uh, on um, uh, test plates. And so the idea there, you could put photoresist down, you expose a photoresist with our laser plotter, and then uh, process the photoresist and then etch into the etch into the substrate if you wanted to. So over the years, I mean, this has become um, probably 
at the current time, probably the most common way of testing A-spheres is computer-generated holograms. And the thing that I always get a, a kind of kick out of this, because when I, when I started to do this back in the 1960s, a long, long time ago, just as I got out of college, uh, it was kind of fun to do, and it gave me a nice source of material to write papers on and give talks on, but to be truthful, it wasn't of much value because the plotters that we had in those days were so bad that we could not make good holograms. In fact, the, the early plotters that I used, we would actually plot it out on paper, hologram on a piece of paper, and then you would photographically reduce it down to the size that you wanted. And I can remember uh, I was living in Boston at the time, and as, as the humidity would change, your paper would stretch, and so your quality of your hologram got worse. And as I said, it was a great thing to write papers on, give talks on, but as far as actually making it a practical test, it, that wasn't very practical. But as years have gone along, the plotters have gotten so good that it's now has become kind of the way of testing A-spheres. Now, if you look at this, you, I mean, you do have errors you have to worry about. And the first error is a plotter distortion, uh, uh, distortion coming from the plotter. And the second is a substrate surface figure error. And the third one is alignment errors. So let's kind of talk about this a little bit. So the first one, the one that used to drive me crazy was a distortion due to the, the plotter that would, um, the pattern we would draw out would have distortion in it. And if we think about it, I mean, you can go through all types of analysis to see what this error is, but just think for a second. What we're doing, we're really are drawing fringes, what it amounts to. And we know that if, I'm, if I have an interferogram of something, I know that the error in the wavefront is given by the deviation in the position of the fringe divided by the average spacing of the fringe. And so this, we use the same analysis here, that the error in the wavefront produced by the hologram is simply given by the ratio of the error in the positioning of the fringe, the line that we're drawing, divided by the localized fringe spacing. And then we'll multiply that by the wavelength to get, uh, so this is the error in units of waves. So we multiply by the wavelength to get what the actual OPD is. And then this depends upon the order number. If we go to second order diffraction, well, the error amounts to twice as much. If we go to minus one order, well, the sign of the error has changed. And so the error really goes as, the order number times the wavelength times the ratio of epsilon over s. The order number is generally 1. And a minus sign here just depends on how you do your sign convention. But um, the order number is generally 1. And so it's the epsilon over s times the wavelength is the wavefront error. And as, as an example, um, if order number is 1, and um, let's say that we have a tenth of a micron error in the positioning of the fringe. And let's say the fringe spacing is 20 microns. That corresponds to lambda over 200 waves. Okay. And if we look at plotters nowadays, if you look at you know, what the electron beam plotters are that the electronics industry uses, I mean, these are very, very conservative numbers. And, um, uh, you know, maybe the smallest line you want to draw is a micron, but what really counts is the position of that line. And, you know, I put down a 50 nanometer accuracy in the position, and that's very, very conservative. And, um, you know, maximum dimension, so I put down 150 millimeters, but it could be much larger than that. So really, the... Uh, the errors are quite small here. And you have similar results for uh, 
laser scanners, in particular for drawing circular holograms. Maybe it's a little harder to draw uh, with a lot of tilt in it, like you can do with an electron beam. But um, um, you can draw circular holograms to about the same accuracies. And so the idea is that you, you calculate on your computer um, the, the shape of the lines that you want. You send that information off to a company that has an electron beam recorder, and they just print out your your hologram for you. And pretty simple to do now. Now, if you do have errors in the plotter, which <coughs> you probably don't have to worry too much about it anymore, but if you do, I mean, you can calibrate the plotter errors simply by drawing straight lines or circular zone plates. And so if you have straight lines, you illuminate this with a plane wave, the different orders will be plane waves. And you can interferometrically measure the different orders and see what aberration is in them. And you can relate that back to the errors in the plotter. In fact, earlier in the course, we talked about measuring plotter errors, and that's really what we were doing. You could draw circular zone plates. And now, if you illuminate these with a plane wave, you'll produce a spherical wave. And so you just interfere these spherical waves with um, other spherical waves and see what aberrations you have. And you can relate that back to the plotter itself. So if you do have plotter errors, you can calibrate it out. But you know, nowadays, you really don't. For the most part, you don't have to worry about that. Solving substrate distortion problems. Well, you know, I, I think I just say the first one here. You, you start out with good substrates. That's the whole, um, whole answer here. And if you have a good substrate to begin with, then you don't have to worry about it. If you don't have a good substrate, well, you can you can calibrate it and subtract it out, but it's easier just to have a good substrate to begin with. At least I say it is. Sometimes it's easier said than done. But Alignment errors. Well, if I have a lateral misalignment, um, the errors would be proportional to the slope of the wavefront. In fact, if I go back here, I like thinking about this for a second, way back here. Let's say, you know, let's say I use my hologram here. I have a lateral misalignment here. To me, that's looking a little bit like a lateral shear interferometer. Because I have, you know, a fringe pattern produced here by by, I think of it in moray terms, maybe. A fringe pattern produced here by this. And I have the fringe pattern on my hologram. And if I have a lateral misalignment between them, that's a little bit like lateral shear. And so the effect of a lateral misalignment will be proportional to the slope of the wavefront. And if I'm testing something with a lot of spherical aberration and I have a lateral misalignment, what aberration am I going to see right away? Coma. Yeah. See coma. So you, you can detect that pretty well. Longitudinal misalignment, well, it's less sensitive if the hologram is placed in collimated light. Um, generally, you, you uh, have good fixturing, so longitudinal misalignment generally is not, a, not too much of a problem. The great thing here is on um, positioning of these holograms. When I'm drawing the hologram, I can put other marks. On, on the hologram. I can put crosshairs on the hologram, for example. Same time I'm drawing the hologram lines, I might as well draw some crosshairs. And I can use these crosshairs uh, to aid in the alignment. So that's kind of nice. 
And the last thing here is I can actually put additional holographic structures on the hologram to aid in both the alignment of the hologram and the alignment of the, of the optical system under test. So what do I mean by that? And I'm going to show some results that uh, Jim Burge did some time ago here. So he, he was making a hologram to test some type of a A-sphere. And so the, the center portion here produced the aspheric wavefront he wanted. And I guess those are the, are the fringes that he um, got by interfering the uh, aspheric wavefront with what was produced by the hologram. But around the outside here, he put some other holograms on here that aided in the alignment. And so by looking at the fringes outside here, he could, that would aid him in, in the alignment of the, of the hologram. Plus he put some other structure on here that produced a crosshair in space. And he's going to use that now in the alignment here. Of, so he was, what he was testing was an off-axis parabolic mirror. And, and when you test an off-axis parabolic mirror, there's always a question of putting the mirror in the right location. And it's off-axis, and so it's a little harder to do. But he knew that it was supposed to be off-axis a certain distance here. And so in his hologram, he put in the structure to produce this crosshair. And so I don't know if you can, can you see that? See a little red thing? Maybe you need good eyes to see it. But there's a little, little red crosshair right there. And he knew that that had to be a certain distance off to the edge here. And so that was a, uh, really aided in the, in the alignment. This is really something that if you're just using conventional null optics, you just can't, you know, you don't have this capability. So I'll come back here to this, this last line here. I mean, this is just such a, a powerful feature of computer-generated holograms that you can put on this additional structure. Um, oh, I keep hitting that putting on the additional structure here to, to aid in the alignment of the hologram. You can produce other structure, crosshairs or whatever to aid in the alignment of the whole, uh, whole optical system. And it's just a huge advantage of computer-generated holograms. So have I sold you on computer-generated holograms yet? I guess I just have a few more results here to show. This was for testing something having, a, this was actually refractive optics, I guess, having about 50 waves of circular aberration and just showing a nice null test. This was showing a um, uh, testing a parabolic mirror without the hologram and, uh, and with the hologram. And then, um, this here is kind of an interesting one. This was, this was for testing an acer that had thousands of waves of acericity. And at the time this was done, it was impossible to make a hologram um, to test the entire wavefront. And so what people were able to do was to put together some other simply a uh, combination of, well, I think it was just a spherical mirror used at a certain conjugate that produced a fair amount of acericity, but it didn't give a null lens, a null effect. But it reduced the acericity down to something that we were able to make a hologram for to test this. So it's a combination of using a partial null lens 
uh, and a CGH. So that got it down, the, the, the simple spherical mirror used at the appropriate conjugates got the asphericity down to a range where the hologram could be made to do the test. Now at the same time, um, the people didn't have enough confidence in the hologram by itself, so they made a very, very expensive null lens to test the same optics. Um, but it ended up, uh, the test results agreed very, very, very nicely. So this combination of partial null lenses, simple, what I call simple partial null lenses with holograms really opens up the range of, of um, ACERs that you can test with a computer-generated hologram. And the last one here is just say, I mean, we, we talked a lot about testing of mirrors uh, with um, holograms. But, I mean, there, you, can, you can test a lens as well. And there are a million ways of doing it. But this is just one that was using a uh, little mock zender. And this was the, uh, the lens under test. Oh, I keep hitting that so much today. Uh, lens under test, and um, then another lens to convert the spherical wave into a plane wave. And then the hologram was, was placed out here. And I guess for this particular test, it was phase shifting, because that would just show a PZT here to do, to do the phase shifting. So any questions on computer-generated holograms? Because I'd love to ask questions on that. I, I love computer-generated holograms so much. Um, okay. So that that completes our null tests, and um, so the next topic will be to go on to non-null tests, and uh, we have a lot of different tests that we're doing here. And so in a non-null test, uh, it, it may not be an interferometric test, but if it is an interferometric test, then even if we're testing perfect optics, we're not going to get straight, equally spaced fringes. But we'll get something um, different from that. And um, then we'll do some type of a computer analysis to determine um, just what we have. And so we're going to start out here with a Scott's test. Um, I bet we have people here who have done the Scott's test. Yes, good. Because I haven't. I've never done the Scott's test. Most of these other tests I've done. So I'm going to rely upon you to help me when I ex explain the Scott's test. Maybe I'll just ask you to explain it. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, scanning pentaprism and then a, a whole bunch of other, of other tests. But I think what we'll do, I think we'll, uh, we'll break at this point. So there's no class next Tuesday. I'm actually going to go to Minnesota. And you can guess how excited I am about going to Minnesota towards the end of November. But I have to go to Minnesota for a day. So there will be no class next Tuesday. And then next Thursday is Thanksgiving. So it will be a week from next Tuesday before we come back here. And then we'll begin talking about these non-null tests.